Well, I want to talk to you today about the story of the treasure hunt. We're in these stories that Jesus uh, has talked about. We're going through the book of Matthew and we're reading about the parables that Jesus told. Now, Jesus told these stories for a purpose. He, there, was a, there was a teaching, there was something that he wanted us to capture. And in the stories we're going to read today, I've titled it The Story of the Treasure Hunt. Now, maybe when you were in college, you were, uh, or in high school, that you, you were like me, I had to read literature. Now, I love to read, I love books, I love novels, I love all kinds of reading. But when I was in uh, college, we were forced to read some things that I would not normally have read. For example, uh, my sophomore year, we, I took a literature class, and um, some pinhead thought that these were great, this was great literature that they made us read, and so I was forced to read it. Now, you don't have to raise your hand, but I wonder how many of you did what I did, and rather than reading all of these pages, you read the cliff notes. I'm sure you can probably get that online now, uh, but... Back then, you had to actually get the cliff notes, and you kind of figured out what the story is about so you could pass or write some kind of report on it, right? Well, I had to read all kinds of stuff. I read Shakespeare. That was awful. I just got to be honest. That was awful. I know some people are like, oh, that's wonderful. Ah, not to me. It was terrible. I read all kinds of poetry, and I like poetry, but, you know, it was boring, right? And then we also, there's some things that we read that I did like. I was forced to read Beowulf in the original language, Old English. And um, you couldn't even understand it unless you had a key. And I did have to look it up and everything. So that was kind of fun. Uh, I don't know why I thought that was fun, but I, I thought it was. And um, then we also had to read the Canterbury Tales. tales. Um, this, you know, I didn't enjoy all of them, but I particularly did enjoy the Miller's Tale. Now, the reason I chose to read the Miller's tale fully was for two reasons. Number one, my name is Miller, all right? And I thought, well, this would be cool. This has got my name in it. And what I discovered as I read that was that it was rather risque, all right? And I was like, I was 19 years old. I'm like, yes, please, give me some more of this, right? And I was reading it, and, and the gist of the story is that there was this woman, she was beautiful, everybody loved her, and everybody in the town was trying to, you know, hook up with her, and she promised this guy a kiss, and to play a trick on him, he thought he was going to kiss her lips, and he ended up kissing her posterior. All right, that's all I'll say about that, and I just thought that was the greatest story ever when I was 19 years old. And then we had to choose a novel that we had to read that was considered a great novel. It was this list that we chose from. And um, I found a book on that list that I thought I would read that was just, I thought would be good. And the only reason I chose it was because of the name of the author. Now, I chose the book, The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. And um, the only reason I thought of Alexander Dumas, because I knew that he had written The Three Musketeers. I'd never read that book, but I honestly thought it was about a candy bar, all right? So I was like, well, it can't be bad if he wrote about a candy bar. It was not about a candy bar. But I, I started reading the book, The Count of Monte Cristo. Now, some of you probably have seen the movie, maybe you've read the book. Uh, it became one of the favorite novels that I've ever read in my life. My plan was to read the first chapter, if it wasn't too long, and then get the cliff notes, and that would be my reading of the great novels that we were, had, we were forced to choose from. Well, I won't give you the whole story, but uh, the story is, in essence, about betrayal and justice and revenge and, futi and forgiveness and the futility of vengeance. But in the story, uh, there was a great treasure hunt. And if you've seen the movie or read the book, you know that it was just an intriguing, intriguing hunt because this man who had been in prison, he had been betrayed, he was innocent, but he had served this time. He was able to find a treasure that was completely life changing. And everybody likes the story of a treasure hunt. 
And so I really enjoyed that book. Well, what we're going to read today is Jesus' version of a treasure hunt. It's Jesus talking about people discovering treasure. Now, the treasure that Jesus is really talking about, it's not gold, it's not rubies and diamonds, it's not a chest full of pirate's treasure, but rather it is a spiritual treasure that you and I need in our life. So begin reading with me in Matthew chapter 13. And we'll read in in verse number uh, 44. If you don't have a a phone or a Bible, you can follow along on the screens. And Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure. Now, let me just kind of stop and and identify for you what the kingdom of heaven is so you understand what we're reading and the story that Jesus is talking about. The kingdom of heaven is, in essence, the work of God in the earth. You could say that the church is a part of the kingdom of heaven. It is the gospel, and it is God's purpose for people to come into a relationship with him. So it's the work of God in the earth. It's the church. It's the gospel. All right? So he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. He was like, nobody's going to get this. I'm hiding this. Then in joy, he goes and sells all he has and buys the field. So he found something of great value. He he put everything on the line for that value, bought. He sold everything he had, bought the field, and obtained the treasure. It was priceless. And then he tells another short story. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. Once again, a treasure hunter who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all he had and bought it. These are people that had discovered something that was incredibly valuable, incredibly priceless. And so they went all in on this incredible treasure. And then he tells a third story. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. And when it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and stored the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, once again, to understand the stories, you got to know what Jesus meant by the kingdom of heaven. It's the work of God in the earth. It's the purpose of the church. It is the gospel going out to all the world. Okay, so that's his purpose. That's his kingdom. So I want to just show you three thoughts today from this passage that help us discover this incredibly valuable treasure. What is that treasure? It's the gospel. It's the fact that we can come into a relationship with the God of the universe. When you stop and think about how incredible that really is, not just that we wonder if God knows us, but we have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe, the one who knows all, the one who created all, the one who knows us better than anyone. He knows our good, our bad. He knows our secrets. And yet he loves us more than anyone. So this is an incredible treasure, the gospel, that Jesus came to this world as God who became human He was God and man at the same time. He became man so he could represent mankind, so he could die. God as spirit cannot die, therefore he had to have a body. And as uh, as a human being, he represented the human race completely innocent, completely sinless. He lived and fulfilled every part of the word of God and every part of God's plan that God originally had as a plan for us 
Jesus fulfilled it, but because he was God, he was able to absorb God's justice and God's wrath on sin. And when he died on the cross, what he did for you and me was he took our punishment for us. He literally ransomed us with his life, with his death and his resurrection. And what happened for you and me was we could not do it on our own. We were incapable. But the gospel shows us that we don't have to be the ones to do it. In fact, we can't do it, but Jesus does that for us. And by his death on the cross and his resurrection, redeems us back to a right relationship with God. And so it's futile to think that the way to be made right with God is by being good, because the Bible says you can't be good enough. Now, once again, by worldly standards, are there good people in the world? Of course there are. There are people that aren't saved that can do good things, like help hurricane victims and, uh, and give money to uh, help uh, fight sex trafficking and all kinds of things. But once again, when the Bible says that there is none righteous, there is none that does good, not even one, it's talking about that our goodness, our depending on our good deeds, it falls far, far short of God's standard, and God's standard is perfection. And so whether you are a, a, a terrible sinner like Hitler, or you're a person that lived a, a selfless, self-sacrificing life like Mother Teresa or Billy Graham, you fall short because just one sin makes you imperfect. We are born that way, and so the solution and the only solution was the gospel. For Jesus to die in our place, and he resurrected, and thank God that's not the end of the gospel. He is coming again, and he's gonna finish out the work that he started. And I'm so looking forward to that day because there will then be no more of the nonsense that we're facing today, no more wars, no more injustices, uh, no more hate, uh, no more crime, uh, no more self-serving people in leadership and in government and politics. And it's going to be wonderful because Jesus will finally fulfill the purpose that he came for. So the gospel is what Jesus is really talking about. That is the great price. That's the great treasure. That is the great pearl. That is the treasure hidden in the field. And it is what you and I must seek. And so that's what, that's what these stories are about, all right? So I'm gonna give you just three thoughts, and it won't be very long, but three thoughts about this. Number one, the gospel assigns personal value. It assigns personal value. You see, the gospel itself is valuable. It's valuable because it shows us how much God loves us. It shows us that God was willing to pay the ultimate price for us. That's how valuable you are in the eyes of God. So it assigns great value. God values you. Do you know that one of the terms the Bible uses to describe you when you come into a relationship with him is this, that you are a treasure? So these stories that show us about treasure hunters, God is a treasure hunter. He is seeking for you to be in right relationship with him because when you are, you are his special treasure. We have an ability as humans, or maybe I should say a tendency as humans, to assign value on things that God does not assign value to. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we'll assign value to someone that's incredibly beautiful. Now I realize that there are many of you like that in the room today, and uh, you have to suffer along with uh, someone like me, all right? So, uh, but no, the fact is we will often put value on the outer appearance, don't we? Now, there's nothing wrong with being beautiful. And, you know, there's certainly nothing wrong with working with what you've got. And as you get older, you've got less and less to work with, right? Uh, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with trying to work on it. Make it look better, you know. Uh, shower, shave, uh, put it, you know, women have power tools that they use, you know, to all every morning. And, um, you know, it's okay, all right? But 
God does not assign value on the outward appearance because the Bible tells us that beauty fades, outward beauty, and that it's fleeting. And God, do we not know that? Uh, It just seems like yesterday that I was able to do things that I can no longer do today. Youth is fleeting. We assign value to people that have lots of money. For some reason, we all want to follow them on social media or find out about their lives. Or like, you know, Hollywood stars, for example. And I'm just going to be honest, and maybe I'm in the minority here. I really don't care what they had for lunch. And I don't really care what some movie star's hairstyle has been changed to. I really couldn't possibly care less about that. And I realized that, you know, when they invented cameras on phones, that we all wanted uh, to be more important. And therefore, we take low quality pictures of the dessert that we had at lunch. And I'll be honest with you, I don't care. All right. You can put that all, you can even get these filters and make your face look like, I don't know what it really looks like. It looks weird to me. Make yourself look like a cat. All right. That's cool. That's fine. Don't expect me to like it. All right. Because I am, I by principle, my wife does it, if I'm honest, and I don't even like it when she does it. I refuse to do it. We put value in places that God doesn't really put value. Okay, but I want you to listen to me. God values you. You are so valuable that he paid the ultimate price. Doesn't matter how much money you have. Doesn't matter how intelligent you are. Doesn't matter how many followers you have on social media. How, many, how famous you are. Uh, how talented you are, how pretty you are, uh, how wonderful you are, how great your job is, how much money you have. It does not matter because God says you are valuable and that is the great treasure that the gospel assigns to you. We are valuable in the eyes of God. God values people. You'll know the value of something by what you're willing to pay for it. And God was willing to pay the ultimate price for you. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's how valuable you are to God. So the gospel assigns personal value. Here's the second thing the gospel does. The gospel requires personal response. You see, the treasure did these people no good until they obtained it? Do you get what I'm talking about here in the story? Remember the first guy, he found treasure in a field. He went and sold everything he had so he could get the money to buy the field so he could obtain the treasure. The second guy, remember what he did? He found a a pearl of great price and it was so valuable. Evidently, you know, the person that had it didn't know the value, but he he went and sold everything he had and got this, this pearl of great price. Now, what is the point of that in Jesus telling this story? Well, the gospel, in order for it to be valuable to you, requires a personal response. Just because God died for the world, just because Jesus died for everyone and loves everyone, until you respond, you don't receive the benefit of that. It's like we talked about earlier that for a very long time, six months after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, there were people in Texas that did not know that they were free. And and often we, we don't understand the value of something until we personally respond. And the, the gospel requires personal response. The first story shows that the gospel is not something you do, but something that God does. That should give you comfort. You see, as human beings, we naturally believe in the merit system. We want to earn our place. We want to earn uh, something so that we get paid what we are owed or what we deserve. That's not the way it is with salvation. You don't want what you deserve. Because what you and I deserve is separation from God. It's God's judgment. It is to suffer 
the penalty of what we have sowed, okay? We are to reap what we sow, but thank God for his grace and his mercy. Because when I understand that God is the one that works on my behalf, that Jesus did what was necessary, I don't have to be the person that earns it anymore. Because what I've discovered about me is probably the same thing you've discovered about you. That no matter how hard I try, I'll never be perfect. No matter how many times I turn over a new leaf or make determined choices and discipline myself, there are times that I fail. And so, thank God, Jesus does what was necessary for us. God is the one that provides it. The second story shows that we all need the gospel. This merchant was seeking And when you have these needs in your life, and everyone has them, even people that uh, declare themselves eventually to be atheists, we all have these desires, which Billy Graham called the God-shaped hole in your soul. Now, even a person that doesn't believe in God, they have this desire, they don't even recognize it. The truth is, we all desire significance. Only God can give that. We we all desire love and true love. Can you love your child? Of course. Can you love your spouse? Of course. But that stems from God. It's impossible to have love without God. And so there are these desires in our life that only the gospel will fulfill. And what Jesus is telling us here in these stories is that this seeking that you have is the desire to have a relationship with God. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, what that means is not this person that desires to be perfect, but the justice and the love that only God can provide. Have you ever noticed that we all, no matter how your relationship with God is, we all have a desire for justice. We don't want justice for ourselves necessarily, but we see something wrong in the world. What do we do? We want justice. We are outraged at the, the sex trafficking that goes on. I read about a, a story just this week of a young woman that was captured at a basketball game. She was kidnapped. She was 15 years old. And they've arrested the people involved with the case. And you know what I felt in my heart? I've never met this girl. I don't even know her name. They didn't put her name in the story. But I felt a sense of justice. I felt like, yes, I'm glad that they caught the perpetrators of that crime. Why? Because in my heart and in your heart, there is a sense, a desire, a God-given thing for justice. And you know what? Blessed are those that seek or desire righteousness for they're going to be filled. Their hunger is going to be satisfied. The third story shows that God is seeking us. In that third story, the story of the net that's being cast, that it captures fish of every kind, that's the story of the gospel. God, not only do, does God do what is necessary for me to be saved, And not only do I have a desire, whether I recognize that desire or not, this desire for significance and justice and love is ultimately a desire for God. Not only do I have that desire, but God is seeking me. That is the good news. He seeks every one of us. Luke 19, 10, Jesus said, the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. For every person born, that metaphor lost, that's you, that's me. That just simply means we're born separated from God. It means that we're born with a sin nature. You don't have to teach a child how to sin, how to lie, how to be selfish, right? It comes naturally to us. So we are all born lost. And the metaphor that the Bible uses about the shepherd finding the sheep, the lost, the found, that's where that comes from. You know what God wants for your life? He wants to find you. To him, he knows exactly where you are. It's not a matter of him wondering where you are. It's a matter of you acknowledging that he 
is the Savior. So Ezekiel 34, 11 says, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. Aren't you glad that God seeks us? He seeks you. He seeks me. Well, the final thought is this. The gospel calls for personal responsibility. It assigns personal value to you and me, okay? You're valuable to God. It, assign, it requires a, a personal response. In other words, you don't get saved. You don't find this treasure unless you respond in faith, unless you say yes to God. But when we do that, there comes a personal responsibility. You say, what is that? Well, the comparison of the good and the bad fish in the story, the third story, it's not about judging our deeds, whether they're good or bad. It's about judging our faith. It's about judging our response to the gospel. And here's the point. We will all stand before God. Even those that don't believe in God, eventually one day we'll stand before God. We will give an account. Now, I've often been terrified of that. As a child, I was taught that, you know, I'd stand before God and he'd recall in front of everybody every wicked thing that I'd ever done. And I was a pretty good kid, okay? I'd not done a lot of bad things. But, you know, even as a kid like that, I was terrified of that. I was like, you mean they will know what I did? Everything? When nobody was watching? Everything? Well, that's not what that means. Because the reason it cannot possibly mean that is because God is holy. And the reason for... Our justification, which means that God declares us righteous, is that God cannot abide sin. Do you know that when you come to him in faith, Jesus paid the penalty for your sin? Therefore, in the same way that our laws say a person cannot be charged with the same crime twice, uh, that's called double jeopardy. In the same way, Jesus already paid the penalty and you cannot be charged. So when you stand before God as a believer, God's not going to just like air all of your dirty laundry. You know why? Because it says that when he looks at us, he does not see our sin. He can't see it. It's not that God, God just chooses not to see it. You know what he sees? He sees Jesus and his righteousness. That's what he sees. And so when he looks at you and and I'm standing before God, he's not going to say, oh, do you remember when you were 17? Okay, do you remember that nobody, you don't think anybody knows this. Everybody gather around, I'm getting ready to tell on Richie. He's not gonna do that. You know what he's gonna look at? He's gonna say, I see my son's righteousness. I see that he paid for your penalty. Come on in, come on in. And so we'll stand before God. But there is a personal responsibility that goes along with this. The Greek word for gather is sunago, sunago. And it implies that God is the one that does the gathering. So this word means to gather or to cause to come together. Now that makes me think of not just the gospel gathering people, but the fact that the church, do you know what the Greek word for the church is ekklesia? You know what that means? It means the gathering. It means the the gathering of the called out. And that's who you are, not like calling you out on your sin, but you've been called out with a responsibility to carry the good news to everyone, to everyone. Well, we have a personal responsibility to share the gospel and to reach people. That's why we use the phrase here at, at this church that inviting is evangelism. I hope you'll invite somebody next week with you. As a church, we have a responsibility to share the gospel. As an individual, you have a responsibility to let people know. And when we are gathered or called out to serve, it means that we're responsible for these things. We're responsible to gather, literally to come to church. We're responsible to um, participate. We say participation is membership. Just because you put your name on a piece of paper, that's not what God's looking for. God's not going to look at you when you get to heaven or stand before God and say, oh, I see you signed a piece of paper. That was great. 
You know what God's looking for? Participation in his body, his family, with the church. And every time we serve and give and worship and go, every time we gather, you know what we're doing? We're fulfilling the responsibility that God has given us because he's called us to this. We are the called out gathering of God's people. Well, I'm running out of time. So uh, in Acts chapter 2, I don't have time to read the passage I was going to read. But basically it talks about the response of people to the gospel. In that chapter, there were 3,000 people saved and baptized at one time, and the church began to grow. And in essence, what it said was that they worshiped together, they learned together, they served together, they gave together, they helped the needy together, and it said about them that great awe fell. You know, I believe that for many Christians, we're missing that great awe. Not the awe of us, not the awe of the gathering, but the awe of the purpose of the gathering. It's Jesus. And the more we see him, the more we recognize him, the more we put him front and center because he is the gospel. Um, He literally is the gospel. And the more we put that forward in our life, the more treasure we have and the greater life that we're going to live. Well, as I conclude this message, I just want to ask you a couple questions. Have you forgotten your value? Oh, I don't mean this self-promoting kind of value that we see on social media. Um, I don't hate social media. I think that there's some good things to it. But I think there's also some dark sides to it. And, you know never been a real big fan of self-promoters anyway. But have you forgotten your value in the eyes of God? He values you so much that Jesus died for you. Have you forgotten the value of other people? Isn't it easy to get so caught up with our busyness and our own life that we forget that other people have value in the eyes of God just like we do? Have you forgotten about the gospel? Have you forgotten your responsibility? We say inviting is evangelism. Do you know that just as making a simple invitation to somebody, you're participating in the gospel? And I hope you'll do that. You see, if you don't do it, who will? If not now, when? We all say, well, I'm going to do this one day. And we tend to put it off, don't we? Let's do it today. Let's realize that God has assigned to us great treasure, that he has said that we ourselves are great treasure and that other people are great treasure, and God wants us to seek that treasure. So that's my challenge to you today. Um, as we transition to a, a new location and a new name, How are you participating? How are you committing? How are you seeking the treasure that God has given to us? Heavenly Father, help us all to seek your treasure. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you have called us. You've blessed us. You have assigned us as treasure. God, I thank you for the gospel. I pray now that in Jesus' name, there would be people that would respond to the gospel today. We see a lot of people that do that. But Lord, today, there are some listening in the room and online that need to say yes. I pray that they would. In their own words, saying yes to Jesus, saying yes to God, saying yes, I want that relationship, saying yes, I want you as my Savior. And I pray that you'd help every one of us to look inside to look inside our hearts and ask ourselves the questions, how am I doing with my inviting, with my gathering, with my committing? How am I doing with my seeking? And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to rest in the glorious treasure of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
For it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.